When I was 12 years old, I went for my very first formal training as an actor. It was, uh, uh, it was a course conducted by an expatriate housewife of English descent from London. And the first thing we were told was that if we were to be actors, we all had to get an equity card. <laughs> equity card. So I was, I, I was really, I didn't know what an equity card was. So I, after the, the class, I went to ask her, what is an equity card? Well, it's a card that you get if you go through a particular course of acting in London and you then become a member of some union or a guild which enables you to work as an actor in London and in other parts of the United Kingdom. And in the mind of this lady, that was the only way you could define an actor. That was the only way an actor was defined. When I tried to tell her that there are actors who are working in kampongs, in, in rickety old wooden stages in Singapore, who do Chinese opera, and Indian actors who are working in temples trying to do ritualized performances of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, this was completely unacceptable. This world of theater did not exist for this woman of the equity card. And for the longest time, for me as a 12 year old, I was having this unbelievable uh, schizophrenia. How do I ever become an actor? Because my parents would never have been able to afford to send me to London. And anyway, I didn't really want to go to London to learn how to speak English and be an actor that way. I didn't really want to. So the only path that was open to me was to get on stage and work with the actors who were willing to see me and accept me as an actor, despite the fact that I didn't have an equity card. And this was a kind of valorization, which I think was common to many people who were working in theater in Singapore. This was something that we had to defy, something that we had to resist, something that we had to oppose. And I only state this because the theatre that we have, the theatre that we celebrate as Singapore theatre today, the theatre for which we are seeking a canon this afternoon, was, as Mr. Ho has put it, built by the artist. It was made by the artist. Not the artists of one language, but artists working in all four languages in Singapore who were, had the vision and the courage and sometimes the sh sheer audacity to put up works which people thought could don't deserve to be on stage. Because nobody thought that a Singaporean consciousness, that a Singaporean desire, that a Singaporean anxiety was worth five minutes on stage. We didn't have the right to be on stage according to the rest of the world. So the fact that we are on stage is a space that we have built for ourselves. And we owe it to ourselves to keep that space open so that others may continue to build. So that there are no unjust or unjust standards and strictures that are put up which will dissuade the young, dissuade the innovative to make new creations and to call it Singapore theatre. So where, where do these elements come from? Where does the elements of Singapore theatre come from? It comes from, up, from all around us, from the streets. And for this, for this, I thank Mr. Ho for telling us about the Karanguni man, the, the rag and bone man, 
And I think I will end this talk. And because I have a right to do so, I will end this talk by quoting another poet who was not Singaporean, but who also spoke in his one of his last poems about the rag, foul, the foul, the rag, the rag and bone shop of the heart. And this is W. B. Yeats' Circus Animals Dissertation, which was one of his last poems. Those masterful images, because complete, grew in pure mind. But out of what began? A mound of refuse, of the sweepings of the street, all kettles, all bottles, and a broken can, old iron, old bones, old rags, that raving slut who keeps the till. Now that my ladder is gone, I must lie down where all ladders start, in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. That's where the canon of Singapore theatre comes from. The foul rag and bone shop of the heart of Singaporeans. Thank you.